श्रेष्ठ मनमी शचिपुत्र स्वूपंतग्रज उपुरीपुरी गोष्ठवाति राधा कुंदम गिरीवर अहो राधिका माधवा प्राप्त यतिपया श्रीगुर ंदुकोतरेन विकसत नीपून छवि प्रोधीकृत भुज हरिहरीद तमसु निर्जरचयतमुर्वीतल गायद परिवृतंद्र स्तुम परिपालित प्रबलित सानंदमालोकित प्रत्याशुमन पलोदय विधो सामोदमादित वृंदारण्य भुवि वृंदारण्य भुवि वृंदारण्य भुवि प्रकाश मधुर सर्वातिशायी श्रिया राधा माधव यो प्रमोदय तो मूललासकलपद्रुम राधा माधव यो प्रमोदय तो माधा माधव यो प्रमोदय तो मूललास कल्प्रुम जय रूप सनातन भट्ट रघुना श्री जीव गोपाल भट्ट दास रघुना साइर करी चरण पंद जाघ्न अभीष्टपुर हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 Okay so my friends
we are currently in the midst of this very interesting and very long Anu chain. And I've even broken up this last one, this 7.8, into several parts. So now we're coming to the last segment. But it's not really, well, we're going to go on to other things before we get to a conclusion and everything gets wrapped up in a nice big ball and we'll be able to see where everything goes. And what, what the point of all these different stories, what the point of all these different things that were told to us, do they have any significance to us? Well, we will answer that as we go along. Those come as a result of mananam. <laughs> So right now we're still in the Shravanam phase. Shravanam phase means just trying to figure out what is he saying and to try to understand it in every possible way, context. Believing that there's some magic potency in the words. It's interesting, you see Jiva Goswami, he's always using the Srimad Bhagavatam for Praman. His chief Praman is the Srimad Bhagavatam. He's, he mentions, you know, he also mentions the important passages from the Upanishads from time to time. We have a bunch of Upanishad passages. <laughs> Our Upanishad passages. But, <clears throat> so now we're going on to the last segment here of the this 4.8. So this whole 4.8 was all about Jaya and Vijaya. So now we're coming to the conclusion of that. All, all these things that were being said. So we're going to have to kind of look at those things. I think I wrote them down, but I was going back and I was looking at them again. But anyway, in a moment, we'll look, we'll look back, we'll do a, a cast our eye back to the earlier parts of this Anuchet. And uh, we will do so in this turn and also in the next, because it's going to come up again, because we haven't actually finished right now. Okay. We're having an examples of abhasa, right? This is currently what's being done here. We're beginning different kinds of abhasas. Because he started out talking about sakshatkar abhasa. Well, that's one side of the coin, but what's the other side of the coin? Huh? So here, uh, these pure devotees, Jaya and Vijaya, they actually are taking on the role, and this is exactly what he's going to be saying in, in another quote, just a little bit below. Hmm? But they're playing a role at the behest, because it's the desire of the Supreme Lord. So they're going to be in a situation of total forgetfulness of their eternal relationship as servants. And they're going to just hold on to that part of the remembrance and they're going to remember you that much more strongly because they're going to remember you with hate in order to fully, you know, give life to that play. They have to act to the maximum. But nevertheless, despite all that, uh, he's saying very clearly, he was saying that they were just play acting. And that play acting was conscious or unconscious. Well, let's say uh, that <laughs> a little bit of both. But I, but if we take it that they, they, of course, now had they genuinely forgotten and they were genuinely hateful, all of a sudden at the last moment they see Krishna, they see Nrsinghu or Varaha or Krishna holding a chakra or whatever. And in that moment, uh, they see, just like in the Shishupala story, which we're going to talk about in a second. Now, Shishupala is the last, yeah? So the three births for Jaya and Vijaya, so Shishupala is one of the last. So now in the... Uh, I have to read one sentence at least before I move on. Because that's what I'm really, I'm really, I'm, I'm talking about exactly what's coming up here. He says, Ato Vairabhavaja Smaranena 
Vaira Bhavo Apagata. All right, so this is a statement. The, but it's being it's part of a bigger sentence. But let's understand the statement first. So Vaira Bhavaja Smaranena, Vaira Bhavo Apagata. All right. So now that's the that's the main theme of the story. Actually, we were seeing this in the Bhakti Sandarbha towards the end, where there the Vaira Bhava Dvesha, huh? that's Chaidi is said to have attained the Supreme uh, through his hatred of God. His particular attainment of the Supreme, however, is not particularly desirable for the devotee. Indeed, it's more like a kind of a hell. If he loses the capacity to appreciate Krishna Leela because he is absorbed in the idea that he himself and Krishna are one, or that he even going beyond that, that he is not even, he is in a genuine state of a transcendence, uh, completely neutralized in swimming in an oceanic feeling of I am, I am Aham Brahmasmi. Uh, you spend eternity like that. Very nice, pleasant. No hassles. <laughs> so, the idea was that that happened to the, uh, when Shishupal and the others, when they were killed by Krishna, then they merged. The, this soul merged into the Brahma Jyoti. This is what is generally understood. Right? So still, even to attain the Brahma Jyoti, they had to be free from uh, their Vairabhava. So what happened was that the Vairabhava was so strong that they were constantly remembering Krishna. And then because of the strength of that thinking of Krishna, uh, they were freed from the very cause of it. All right, this is, the, this is kind of the theme, underlying theme. We'll see this in the next one, the example of the sugar candy and the, the taste of the sugar candy. This is going to be explained later, but that, you understand the idea of the, the idea that the sugar candy tastes bitter until you've taken enough of it because that's the medicine. The medicine tastes bitter, and you can tell you're getting better because it stops tasting bitter. Mm -hmm. So, Vairabhava Apagataha. The Vairabhava went away by the Vairabhava just Maranena. So now this is the basic story of Jaya and Vijaya. It goes on a little bit beyond that because we talk in the, in, in, in just uh, what Jiva Goswami takes out of that because very interestingly, right, he's presenting the idea of Raganuga Bhakti. And he decides to present Raganuga Bhakti uh, by using these verses from. Narada's teachings to Yudhishthira at the time of the Rajasuya sacrifice, and which is told just before the story of Hiradikashipu. So again, uh, actually, Madan Mohanji uh, wrote a very nice little comment on the, uh, at the beginning of this discussion of Jaya and Vijaya. I forget exactly what title he used now. Uh, but at any rate, the idea is saying that the whole Bhagavatam could somehow or another be uh, as the, the, you know, the, the fall and rise of Jaya and Vijaya, that somehow the theme of Jaya and Vijaya carries quite strongly through the Bhagavatam from the third canto, coming again in the seventh canto in this story. And then uh, its importance is reflected because the seventh, the first chapter of the seventh canto is briefly repeated at the beginning of the Rasa Lila. So this is why it's significant. And that's where the clue comes from, because there it says that the gopis attained Krishna through Kama. 
So how to explain this karma? Hmm? So the karma is being explained by saying that dvesha, krodha, bhaya, fear, and anger, that if they are carried to the extreme, that those can also lead to liberation. But the kind of liberation that it leads to is not exactly very suitable to the devotee. That's the problem with it. It's mercy for sure. It puts someone out of their misery. They get the opportunity to actually become one with the thing that they were envious of. The thing that they were afraid of, they lose themselves in it and become unafraid. But of course, it's a bit of a difficult concept. Nevertheless, the idea is strongly there. So even in the, those uh, sections of the Bhakti Sandarbha where Jiva Goswami is drawing on these passages in order to help us to understand what is meant by Raga Nuga Bhakti. Hmm? And it's that, that uh, idea of following the emotional current, having a strong emotional current. So that's why uh, later on uh, it is said, here, let me take the verse I have it here. Yatha Bhairanu Bandhena Martyastanmayatam Iyat Natata Bhakti Yogena Iti Me Nishchita Mati So this verse is coming from that section where Narada Muni is telling the question is, Yudhishthira is asking the question, what's going on here? Shishupal was abusing Krishna, and yet we see that at the end, he goes, uh, uh, you know, his soul goes flying into the air and then merges uh, in with Krishna's body. Mm. So what's with that? He's supposed to be, a, he's, a, he's a, the worst of the worst. Uh, he's the, an offender to God, and yet somehow or another, uh, uh, you give him the complete mercy. By killing him, you give him liberation. And his soul goes for all eternity to merge into your being. So this is liberation. So they're puzzled. So Narada has to explain. So in some places that differentiation is not made so greatly. But in, in fact, what we're getting here from this segment, right? The verse here, let me just give you the translation of that verse from the seventh canto. The absorption in Bhagavan that a mortal being can reach through being continuously bound by enmity cannot be attained by following the regulative principles of bhakti yoga. This is my definite opinion. This is Narada Muni who is saying this. He was the one who taught Vaidhi Bhakti. <laughs> so the teacher of Vaidhi Bhakti says, you can, there's a, a better way, if you can get your mind to become attached to Krishna in such a way, even if it's with, uh, even with its Vairanubandha, even if it's with its enmity, uh, then uh, you are going to be actually better off because your mind will be more totally absorbed. You'll understand what it means to be in samadhi, to be totally conscious of Krishna. Even if you're doing it, because if you're doing it in hatred, you're still seeing it. You're still, you're still absorbed in it. There's some people who are like that about uh, Islam, for instance, they like this Islam. They become absorbed in Islam, so I mean, bringing down Islam. <laughs> uh, anyway, the war of ideas goes on. Hmm? But that's the kind of thing, Vairabhav, that these are our enemies. So because they are our enemies, we must combat them. Hmm? So this Vairanu Bandha, so these, but the point is that there's a second layer to this story, and the second layer to this story is that it's all an act. 
It's a story that's being told, it's on the stage. The real thing that's going on here is that Krishna has given his mercy to Jaya and Vijaya so they can play these roles and they can get this uh, experience of fighting with Krishna, right? Like friends who like to fight, who like to box, who like to do mixed martial arts or whatever. And Krishna wants to fight, but of course he's God. He has to be a little bit vulnerable, but of course he's not going to lose. Because that's not the question. It's just a game. Hmm? Who wins and who loses? You might be destined to lose. So Krishna wins. That's okay. You serve the purpose. So, still, nevertheless, the point here, of course, the point is that this is being uh, discussed again. This is going to be repeated in the 10th canto at the beginning of the Rasa Lila. And because already it's already been said that Kama Gopya, that the gopis attained him through Kama. So now with Vaira Bhava, is that what happens to the gopis also? Is that what they get? The gopis get this, they get Brahma Gyan. Like Shishupa, <laughs> are the gopis just some other, you know, cursed nursemaids in who've been sent down by some curse? There are some stories like that in some Puranas. Vrinda Devi, Sridam Saka, and they were cursed to come to the earth, and so they get into all kinds of trouble. Right. <clears throat> So the point is that they're putting on a play, so that's the underlying thing, right? So the underlying thing is that the, 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 what the situation that they've been put into is not to be accepted as a real situation. The story is real. The, the, the point of the story is real. But the actors who are playing, they're also real on a different level. So it was already told, right, that Jaya and Vijaya, they entered into the, those, those other bodies just as though, they didn't say it, but I'm saying, that just as though they were costumes. They animated them. They brought them to life. Chaitanya Kritya. They made them animated and made them alive. So this is the, they were just that, like the soul in the body, the soul animating the body. But being eternal spiritual souls, they had sufficient, so that's why it said, with their potencies, along with their potencies, the potencies that were innate to their transcendent status, their residence of Vaikuntha. So they had Swabhavik Siddhikena, Swabhava Siddhis. Swabhavika cities, natural cities that were to them. So that's why they could do what they did with the, you know, how was Hiranyakashipu able to do with all the things that he did, right? How was Hiranyakashipu able to be so powerful that the gods had to go and appeal to the Supreme Lord and that he please come and save them from the impossible problem uh, that these demons were presenting. And so those Stories are the, the stories that are told of how God came to save the world in unusual situations. So, that was the story of Jaya and Vijaya. So the point was, so there's two things going on. One is the lesson that was told in Bhakti Sandarbha. And so that lesson, when he says here at the beginning, he's kind of summarizing the lesson because he didn't say it really that clearly. But he says, Ato Vaira Bhavaja Smaranena. So this is what we're talking about in the Bhakti Santarva. 3.18. The link is in the, uh, well, you'll have to go to the, to the blog post and you'll find the link. 
Therefore, uh, so, ato vaira bhava jasmaranena, vaira bhava pakakata iti ubhayam api bahyam. So here's this translation, it's a little difficult, but we'll see if it's okay. I read it a few times and it's okay, but still it's a difficult sentence, I think. Therefore, both the feeling of animosity as well as the remembrance of Bhagavan that arose out of this animosity and dispelled it were external to their spiritual bodies. This is continuing from the previous uh, sentence where it says that they were animating the, these bodies of Hiranyaksha and so on, the costumes. So it was with this intention that Bhagavan Vishnu himself said, go, do not be afraid, may you be at peace. I like that. It's good, it's Sanskrit also, right? So what was it again here? Etad avipratya aiva, etad avipratya aiva, Sri Vaikuntena Pi Uktam Yatang Ma Vaishtam Astusham. So three things in one sentence. Yatam go. Duo. Two people. I mean, excuse me, Yatam plural. Because he's talking to the four. Excuse me, what am I talking about? He's talking to Jaya and Vijay. Yatam, it's dual. Two people. If it was plural, it would be yata. But here it's yatam, because it means two people. Ma vaishtam, again, two people. Ma vaishtam, don't be afraid. Nice aorist imperative. Astusham, a blessing. Okay. May you be at peace. Sham means peace. So yatang ma bhaishtang astusham. So go, do not be afraid, may you be at peace. So here's the whole verse. I like this verse. I think we did it before, but maybe uh, we'll go through it again here. Bhagavan anugao aha. This is obviously a feature of my class. If you want to learn a little bit of Sanskrit, follow. You look at the you look at the, the text here. Follow along with me. You'll pick up some stuff. You'll enjoy the more the more you understand Sanskrit, the more you enjoy the Bhagavatam. The more you enjoy Bengali, the more you'll enjoy Chaitanya Charitamrita and so on. At any rate, here he goes. So the name verse is Bhagavan Anugao Aha. Yatang ma bhaishtamastusham brahma te jak samartopi antum leche matang tume. Very compact verse there. So Bhagavan spoke to his two followers, Jaya and Vijaya, and he said, Yatam, go, don't be afraid. Be May peace go with you, that kind of thing. Brahma now explains, Brahma tejaha samarto pi hantum neche matam tume. So I'm able to stop the curse of the four Kumaras. It would be easy for me, Brahma teja, but I'm not going to do it because in actual fact it is what I myself want. So don't think that anything inauspicious could arise from my desire. So he goes on and explains more clearly what he means by that. So also he's going to quote a little bit more here. He says, Atatahi Hiranyaksha Yudhe Puranu Shaktam Ityadi Padye. So now he's not interested here in the verses, but he's interested in uh, Sridhar's commentary. Because now he's, what is he getting at here? He wants to say it's not real, right? 
that Jaya and Vijaya don't really feel hatred, they're playing. And Krishna is playing at it. Right? They're playing at it with a lot of vehemence. And the more that they can put themselves into it, the more they enjoy it, the more they sweat. Right? The more they grunt, the more they, like Krishna with Jambavan, 28 days. <laughs> this goes, the whole forest is being knocked down by the force of their blows. This is the kind of uh, long battle that goes on. Krishna enjoys and gets up, works up a good sweat. <laughs> So, this is with his trainer, but the more that they're alive, the more that they can go at it, you know, the more they can do it unrestrained, the more pleasure they get from it. So, what is he saying here? So, this is what he's got. So, you can just imagine. When Jiva Goswami finds something that, uh, he, that gets, if he finds Sridhar Swami to support something that he really considers important, and then you can be sure that he has got it on an index card and he's ready to produce it at the appropriate time. JJ Sirati, JJ Sirati. I should uh, say to you, of course, now you see I'm, uh, well, all right. I was going to introduce Giri Hari. And I should do it because I'm, even though I'm unfit, but I thought that I would bring Giri Hari today. Actually, I was wondering where to place him, but I've just placed him beside me here. I was thinking of putting him up by the camera, you know. If I put him up by the camera, then I'll be able to look at him and speak to him more directly. So he's not like the special guest, but he's like the Maharaj Parikshit. Jai Jai Siddhartha. There we go. Okay, well, that's good. So, so this is the, what he says. This is what uh, Sridhar Swami is saying. Prachanda manyutvam. So the words he's, this is the word he's, this is the word he's taking out of the shloka. Right? Prachanda manyutvam. Adikshepa adikam chanukarana matram. So, all this Prachanda manyutvam. Manyutvam here means anger. And prachanda means really hot and forceful. Like chandi, you know, the goddess chandi. She's very angry and forceful and very you know, kind of chandi. Angry goddess. Red hot. Chandi. So here, chanda, prachanda. Hot like the sun. Anger. Now, prachanda manyutvam adikshe padikam. Cha. Hmm? So then there's adikshe padikam. So the adikshe, this is what, you know, like they're, they're, before they fight, they gotta insult each other, right? So this is uh, the, they, uh, at the beginning of the fight, they enjoy poetically, you know, each one has his style. Of course, we've all seen these in the, in, the, this is something that is lampooned, of course, in the kind of chivalresque, in the world of chivalry in, in Europe. But nevertheless, prachanda manyutvam adikshe padikam, they have to have this bad, little battle of insulting words that you're a worm, you know, I'm going to reduce you to nothing, uh, you know, like you, and so on and so forth. So a bombastic speech and building up one's own courage and uh, trying to diminish that of the other, of the opponent. What they call now, what do they call that? They call that trash talking. <laughs> So Hiranyaksha and uh, Varaha 
There's that little bit of trash talking going on. So it is prachandamanyutvam adikshepadikam chanukarana matram is only anukarana. So anukarana means imitation, it's not real. Play acting. Daitya vakya bhitanam devanam apaya nibrittaye. So, this is all uh, in order to, so both are participating. He wants to show here that Krishna himself is not, what, two, the different things have to be shown. Not only Jaya and Vijaya, that their, their anger and hatred of Krishna is not really real. But that Krishna's anger towards them also is not really real. That he's also play acting. But it's that by playing it out that he is, let's say, fulfilling his desire. So, chanu karana matram daitya vakya bhitanam daitya vakya bhitanam devanam vaya nivitaye. So, the purpose of it is to relieve the fear that the gods were having on account of hearing all the uh, threatening words coming from the demon, from the daitya, from Hiranyaksha. So Krishna came there, or Varaha came there and bellowed out and uh, so on and so forth in order to uh, give courage uh, to the gods who were in fear uh, of their lives on account of uh, Hiranya Hiranyaksha's incredible power. Right? The siddhi, the siddhis that were present in him due to its being the presence of jaya. No one could equal, there's no demon, there's no earthly demon who could possibly have the siddhis and the powers that Krishna's own gatekeeper would have. So, the gods are not into it. They don't fully understand the play that's going on. And that's what makes them good audience. That's what makes them a good audience. The, the, the play is going on for the, for, the, for, the, for the people who are sitting in the audience. And so the ones who are sitting in the audience are the gods. And so their fear, which is of course being produced by these events which are ultimately unreal. They're just theater. But that theater is producing fear and happiness and anger and all these other emotions, which when we feel them as an audience, those are called the rasas. So here, the bhaya is one of the rasas. Bhayanaka, you know, something frightens you, that's also a rasa. So when we sit in a, watching a film or a play and we tremble, and go to a, a you know, go to a, you know, the, the heroine is hanging from the side of a cliff and the hero is rushing to the point just if he can grab her hand before she slips and falls and the music rises and the drums beat and Finally, his heart racing, he manages to grab her before she falls. And the bhaya, the bhaya nivritta, the audience was feeling fear. <laughs> oh no, the heroine, she can't be killed now. Well, she can't possibly be killed. How the heroine can be killed? Well, of course, sometimes in the real world, she do get killed. In the real world, where things do not happen the way they do in stories. Yes? <laughs> Here we listen to stories. You know, I'm, I, I was, one of the things, people sometimes don't know why I like Jordan Peterson. Okay, so I mean, I, you know, what do I can say? You know, he, he, he's a, I, like, I like Jordan Peterson, a lot of the things that he says. And I think that the first thing that really caught my attention when he was talking about stories and the importance of stories, and um, 
he was he, he, he was telling me this is one of the first films that that it is of Jordan Peterson giving a, a, a talk to a bunch of quite old people mostly uh, for the what was the, for the television Ontario for the government channel in of the provincial channel the, and uh, it was a kind of an educational program and he gave a slideshow and he was telling his children's story. And so he wants to say, so the, the point that he was making, hmm, that we tell these children's stories, these are actually condensed wisdom, but they're supposed to be condensed wisdom. The oldest stories are these stories of condensed wisdom that we tell our children. And they become anchored deep in the subconscious of the child. They become, they become wedded to archetypes. They become archetypal. So people, actually, I'm uh, going to hold off on talking about archetypes for the moment. But at any rate, we have to look at this as though it was a, a, this is actually what is happening, the, the, this is actually what goes on. Uh, the rasa in the, in the Western concept is the awakening of the archetypes. The, when the archetypes are awakened in the subconscious of the audience, uh, then that exerts uh, a particular uh, uh, reaction of pleasure. All right, so anyway. The Bhaya Nivritaya, the Deva, the gods, uh, there Bhaya was removed, the audience here, fear was removed, that's the way he was playing it. It's not real feeling, he's playing it. Yeah? It's for the benefit of the audience, not for Hiranyaksha. Uh, so vastuta stena tata nukta tvena kopadi hetu abhava iti esha. So Sridhar Swami goes on to say that he doesn't, in really, that he didn't say that, and therefore there was no real reason to be angry. Uh, well, the vastu is tata anukta tvena. That wasn't he who was saying it, that was the part that he was playing that was saying it. So let's see what the translation is here. He has the second one also. Uh, similar, well, I'll just read the second one. A little more so, it just has the one word, Karala. So in that Padya, in that verse, chapter 19 of the third canto, uh, there's the, also connected to the fighting. And there the word Eva comes up. And Sridhar Swami says, Eva here shows that in reality, he was not really feeling anger. Krodha bhava. There was no anger. So that's why he puts the word eva. It's like anger, as though he were angry. As though he were angry, but not that he was really angry. That's what he wants to say. Okay, so what do we got? Translation here. So similarly, in his commentary on 3.18.9, in the description of the battle between Hiranyaksha and Varahadev, Swami Pada writes, the terrible anger and disrespect shown by Bhagavan was merely an imitation for removing the fear of the demigods who were terrified by the words of the Daityas. In reality, there was no cause of anger because he, Hiranyaksha, did not say the abusive words. And while commenting on verse 319.8, also he writes, the words as if, Eva, mean that in reality he felt no anger. Okay, so it's all a play, it's all abhasa, it's not real. That seems to be what he wants to say. So next, the Sijiva Goswami explains that not only is Bhagavan's anger unlike that of materialistic people. So he doesn't respond to anger with anger. It's not going on like that. But in the dance, in the dance there are appropriate steps. 
Right? When you're doing a dance that it starts and it's also with a fight, you have a certain ritual that you go through, the shouting ritual, the clever name-calling ritual, the well-turned poetic insults phase, hmm? and then the actual physical tussle. So, there was the whole thing about, uh, so, but he says, so naturally, if the fight is done by two uh, ordinary people, two drunks outside a bar, well, then they're feeling real anger towards each other, or real fear from each other, and so on. Mm -hmm. Because it's real, part of the real world. But with Krishna, and with, with Narayan, and with all these incarnations, uh, and with uh, Jaya and Vijaya, as the demons, this is not possible because they're already situated in knowledge. So once you're in the, situated in knowledge, you can't really ha you can't really be covered again. If you come from from Vaikuntha Loka, you don't really fall from Vaikuntha Loka. This is, uh, of course, uh, I, I'm going to talk about that a bit later because I think that uh, I've been thinking about it. And that probably Jaya and Vijaya is also meant to be something of a metaphor uh, for understanding uh, the condition of the jiva. So we often see things where it says, I, I don't know if I'm going to talk about that right away, but the idea is that, you're, uh, that there is a dimension of this story which applies to the conditioned soul, to the situation in the material world. So to the situation of a sadhaka. Because what's the point of these stories? These stories only exist for the sake of the sadhakas. These stories are to give us some encouragement or to give us some understanding of the mechanics of the sadhana, how remembering Krishna works, what's the power of remembering Krishna, and so on. So. Their animosity was not real, it only appeared to be so. Not only is Bhagavan's anger unlike that of materialistic people, but that Jaya and Vijaya's animosity was also not real, it only appeared to be so. All right, so we already just went back, to the, remember back now in the previous um, talk from this very hundred change of 7.8, now already subdivided, now subdivided again, right? So in this part of the Anachay, we were talking about that. We were talking that, uh, um, uh, that Jaya Vijaya's animosity was also not real, but only appeared to, to be so. Right? That, I, that Bhagavan's anger is unlike that of the materialistic people, but the Jaya Vijaya's animosity was also not real. It only appeared to be so. So here, do you, um, Translation goes on. This is because bhakti is eternal. This is Jeev, um, excuse me, uh, Satyanarayan Das Ji saying. This is because bhakti is eternal, and once attained, is never lost. This has been discussed elaborately in Bhakti Sadarbha, one to twenty, one thirty-three to one forty-one. We have reference. In the later portions of Bhakti Sandarbha, we saw a discussion of Raganuga Bhakti based primarily on verses from Canto 7, Chapter 1, where Narada was explaining to King Yudhishthira that the strength of emotion, whether in anger, hatred, or lust, etc., resulted in one's becoming absorbed fully in consciousness of Bhagavan, and that some individuals had attained perfection through this method. The examples given there were Kangsa for fear and Shishupala for hatred. Shishupala was the last of Jaya's three births as a demon. In the quoted passage from the Vishnu Purana, it was stated that although Shishupala had seen Krishna, it was not until the last moments when he saw the Sudarshan Chakra coming, leaving Krishna's hand, and he saw him as he is for the first time, so the important summary of that teaching was uh, given in Bhakti Sandarbha 3.18. So I'm like, you know, just narrowing it down, narrowing the subject down, because that becomes an important subject. I've already 
mentioned a couple of times, you know, Kamat Gopya. So now for understanding the gopis attaining Krishna through Kama, that's gonna that came and this is really what uh, what the uh, the how, how you can have you, you say Kama, that's not a good thing, is it? So how can Kama is just like Dvesha is not a good thing, and just like Vaya is not a good thing. So how can Kama be a good thing? So the gopis are like the demons, like like Chedi and so on, they're just someone playing a role. What's going on there with that? Let's have a little, you know, we need to go into that into a little more detail, right? So that's going to, that's really what's there at the end of the Bhakti Sandarbha. But the point was that it was being admitted uh, because, uh, and it goes on to say why Kama reveals Krishna in a particular way. <coughs> it's not just a question of revealing Krishna as like for, it was for Kangsa, yeah? Or uh, uh, Malanam Ashani, right? And for Kangsa, it was the, the Mrityo, Mrityo Bhojapate, Virada Vidusha, Satyam Parang Yoginam. Everyone is seeing Krishna differently. But the real of the ones there that we're having in the Malanam, the, 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 uh, the wrestlers, they saw Krishna as a and Balaram as thunderbolts, adamant, immovable, unbreakable. They were fearsome, just like a, a lightning bolt, a flash of lightning is fearful. So there are two boys, Krishna and Balaram, but to the mullahs, to the wrestlers, they appear like thunderbolts. Mullana Mashani. And so on. Pitrok swashishu has for pitrok shishu. Anyway, all the different relations, the ten different relations given in that verse. But we're interested here. So kama, so it says that saksha asmaro nari smarach murtiman strinam smarach murtiman. So the women the women of Mathura, as well as the gopis from Vrindavan, they saw Krishna in the arena. And when they looked at him, he looked to them as Cupid himself, as the most beautiful, as the most picture of attractive beauty. Everything that a, a woman dreams of as being the man whom she will love looked upon Krishna as son, the god of love incarnate. So that's the Kamad Gopyo. So now is that good or is it bad? Well, uh, Krishna's qualities, that's why he's called the Dira Lalit. Because Krishna's most charming qualities, his beauty, his artistry, his wit, his intelligence, his playfulness, his uh, musical talent, his dancing ability, all the fine arts of the erotic mood, the Tira Lalita, Nishchinto Tira Lalito, Syat Praya Priyasi he has willingly surrendered himself uh, to the woman's world. <laughs> That's Dira Lalit. Huh? Navatarunya. Nishchinto. This is the one. Yeah. He's got not a worry, not a care in the world. He just wants to have fun. He wants to tease the gopis. Vaidagdhya. He has his vidagdha. Vidagdho Navatarunya Parihasa Visharada. He knows how to get everyone to laugh. He's a comedian. <laughs> My friends, let me introduce you to God. Mm -hmm. He's a flirt, Vidagdha. Navatarunya. He's just a young guy, an adolescent. 
is always that he plays young. He's, he's, he's vibrant with youth. Navatarudhi. Parihasa Visharada. He's very funny. He makes jokes. He makes people laugh. He's the life of the party. Parihasa Visharada. Nishchinto Dhiranadito. Satraya Prayasi Prasha. So he's never worried. That's the world of the hero, the Jira Lalita Nayaka. And that's what Krishna is, right? Brajati a Krishna Hoy a Jira Lalit Kama Bija Yes, Nirantara Kama Krira Jahara Charit. Nirantara Kama Krira Jahara Charit. And now that's pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. That Krishna's love affairs preoccupy him. That's the Krishna of Braja. That's the Krishna that we worship. Right? <laughs> so um, we're going to have to face the fact that people have criticized Krishna since time immemorial, what well, is very inappropriate of a god to behave in such a way with the wives of the cowherd men, and so on, that this karma business is going on, this illicit love is going on. How can God participate or partake of such activities? It is inappropriate for God. So we will pass a law and say God cannot do this. So people do not approve of Krishna's rasa lila. Right? And that's to explain, so it's important to understand, to explain this idea of the karma, that the gopis attain Krishna through karma. So what's being explained there in the Bhakti Santarva is the strength of the feeling, that's what's in, being encountered. And you see what Narada Muni says in this verse here, the one that I quoted. Hmm? Yata bhairanu bandhena martyas tanmayatam iyat natata bhakti yogena iti me nishchita matihi. Right? So yata bhairanu bandhena. So the, the, the degree to which you hate, if you can hate Krishna to such a degree, martyas tanmayatam iyat. A human being will go, so here it doesn't say anything about Krishna, right? It's just talking about ton, uh, something, to concentrate, to fix your mind on something. So if you want to fix your mind on something, you become very angry about it, right? Then your all your attention, all your senses, and all your emotions, everything, you know, that oh, we've got to do something, have a riot or something, you know, that this is an important issue, we have to... You know, reveal our anger. We have to let our anger out publicly. Hmm? So there, they're totally absorbed. They're completely 100% into their anger. They're thinking about their objective. So the mind, their attention, their absorption, the feeling of... And that gives always a feeling of uh, uh, exhilaration. This is why all these mass movements, you know, Nazism and so on, people, there's a, a, a rush that comes uh, when you suddenly become part of a crowd and everybody's feeling the same thing. Like hating, you know, like in 1984, the, 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 the two-minute hate. <laughs> this is a devilish imagination, but not too far from the truth there. So, so yata vairanu bandhena, the point is that your feelings of hatred can become so strong, they become stronger. It's stronger than love. So there was marchas tanmayatam So a person will become absorbed in something, totally absorbed in something because of that emotion. Okay, so now how do we apply that? Because here the problem is, he's saying, natata bhakti yoga gena. 
The problem here, so this is the problem that we're talking about. This is why this is why this particular set of verses is being given as an example of Raganuga Bhakti. Mm -hmm. Because here the problem with Bhakti Yoga, so here he's talking about Vaidhi Bhakti. He's talking about Vaidhi Bhakti Yoga. So Narada Muni is himself has just been saying that he is it was stated that he was the one uh, who attained uh, Krishna through ritual practice of bhakti yoga, Vaidhi Bhakti. So now Narad Muni himself is saying again that uh, this Vaidhi Bhakti is not as strong as the anger. So now somehow or another, if we want to get our bhakti to become empowered by emotion, that's actually a desirable thing. Hopefully, if, that, if we can do that, that will be provoked through something intellectual or something resembling intelligence. Not that we simply become emotional uh, on the basis of some false understanding of the self. It's not an argument for general emotionality. It's a an argument for seeking out the emotion. For trying to understand the, the feeling uh, that arises and why that feeling is significant. Why do sometimes tears come to your eyes? So, Anger is a strong emotion. Fear is a strong emotion. And lust, desire, is a strong emotion. But of the three of them, the first two have been cast aside. They're not to be followed, not, a, not recommended. You have to really do a heavy bit of lifting. You gotta really get, you know, you really gotta hate bad. Now, I don't know. To be quite honest with you, I sometimes wonder that there's some me mechanism in these. What happens to the atheist? <laughs> what happens to the atheist? Is that what they want? Does atheists want to be? Because I think that the most of the atheists are probably, you know, they're still hanging on to some kind of God, however subtle it might be. <laughs> some kind of because God just means some kind of absolute truth, really. So if you have an ab so if you come to some kind of absolute truth and absolute belief in your own particular understanding, uh, in a way that's a kind of God in itself. And it can also become an idol, right? The living God and the idol. So the living God is the one that is active now, right? The, the living God is the one that you're interfacing with, the interactive God. <laughs> and the idol God is the one that you... Uh, carry around uh, as a kind of a symbolic gesture. At any rate, the living God, you can have a hatred relationship with the living God, but that's not really recommended. Now this principle of having desire for Krishna, love for Krishna, in the way that the gopis loved Krishna. With desire for him. Right? There's no secret about it. I mean, sometimes they try to make it look like the, the, the gopis were not, were pre-pubescent, and so there was nothing, not, no hanky-panky going on at the Rasa Lila. But uh, I don't think that that's what uh, Sridhar Swami thinks. I don't think that's what the others think either. So, the absorption in Bhagavan that a mortal being can reach through being continuously bound by enmity cannot be attained by following the regulative principles of Bhakti Yoga. This is my definite opinion. So this is the challenge here. You know, that how can you feel the only option that's really open to you here, but then we, this is what will happen. Jiva Rupa Goswami is going to take this idea of karma and desire, the desire for love, and the desire for love eat different kinds of relationships. They reflect karma in different degrees. Right? The, the desire to have a, a hero figure. 
the desire to serve, the desire to be to have a friend, the desire to have uh, um, to be a, a loving parent, and also the having the, to to have to know what it is to be a loving son or daughter. These different relationships. So they're all subdivisions of karma, because they're all things that in the material world, if you have dharma, artha, karma, then they all fit into the category of karma. Your family, your relatives, all the happiness of material life, those are all karma. You have a good wife, you have good children, this is heaven on earth. Hmm? You see your own grandchildren, your own home grows, and so on and so forth. These are the pleasures of the worldly life, uh, traditionally. And still, to some extent, I would say yes. So, now, all right, so now we're coming to the end of this uh, thing. And I'm not sure if I'm going to divide it up because, because. All right, so I don't think I finished my comment there. But the point was that you, so that, that is the external aspect of the story. That's not the story that we're telling now. Don't get the two stories mixed up. Two things are two. One is the moral of a story that was told uh, as a lesson. And the other one is what is actually happening on a subtler level where devotees are playing particular roles in order to give pleasure to Krishna. So they're playing out the roles uh, in order to give pleasure to Krishna. And that pleasure that they give to Krishna, yes, indeed, to some extent, it's like when the, when the time comes for the take the final bow, the final curtain, you see, then the full glory uh, of the uh, achievement, when the applause comes from the audience and... Uh, Everyone sees that Hiranyaksha or Hiranyakashipu, that they were just figments of God's imagination. So, it is also improper to think that other devotees would feel happy by knowing that Jaya and Vijaya have turned into real enemies of the Lord. So that was one of the things that was talked about before. In the material world, people in general are envious of others and thus feel happy to see their fears fall down. But this does not happen in a bhakti. Bhaktas feel happy when they see that Bhagavan and his devotees are happy. Tat sukhe sukhi. They have no malice in their hearts. Thus it is to be concluded that their animosity was not real. Okay, so the other things that were said, all the other things that were said about it, they wants, but Jiva Goswami wants to make sure you know that their animosity was not real. It is not possible that Jaya and Vijaya could lose their bhakti. It is also not possible that they could be separated from their spiritual bodies. Jaya and Vijaya are bhaktas with pure preeti for Bhagavan. It is not possible to lose one's preeti and become an enemy of the Lord. Thus it was said above that their animosity towards Bhagavan was not caused by the curse of the Kumars. Considering these facts, the only possible only possible explanation, Artapati, of their becoming Asuras is that they had another set of bodies that were material. They entered into those bodies with their spiritual bodies and brought them to life. By the will of Bhagavan, they acquired the inimical mood in these bodies. It is like putting a mask on one's face and then acting according to the person represented by the mask. They did this to give Bhagavan the pleasure of fighting. Nobody except the associate of Bhagavan has the power to challenge him to a fight. Therefore, it is his associates who play the role of his adversaries. The asurika bodies, the feelings of enmity, 
and absorption in Bhagavan out of those feelings and the removal of this enmity on account of such an absorption were all external to their spiritual forms. Since the anger of the Asuras was only external, the anger of Bhagavan was also a show. This is understood from the comments of Sridhar Swami on 318.9 and 319.8 cited in the Anucheda. Okay, so we went through a lot of stuff there. And, you know, this is this, uh, this seventh Anucheda also happens to be slightly mysterious. So we're chugging along right to nearly to the end of the seventh uh, Anucheda. And when we get to the end of it, then we'll do a little bit of a review of exactly what was going on there. It's quite a mysterious Anuched, really. There's a lot of different things going on. I think we'll get a clearer picture in the next section. So tune in. Jai Sri Radha.